Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Kuo, Associate Director of Development and Alumni Relations at GSAP. It is my pleasure to welcome you tonight to hear about this year's Incubator Prize projects on climate, health, and cities. Here to introduce the program is Professor David Benjamin. David is the founding principal of The Living, a New York-based studio that combines research and practice, exploring new ideas and technologies through prototyping. David is a faculty member at GSAP and a graduate of the MARC program. All of these factors have contributed to his success directing the GSAP incubator since the program was initially founded as a co-working space. David, thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, Leslie. Uh, thanks for kicking us off. And uh, thank you to everyone for being here, both the presenters and the audience. Um, so I just want to offer some very brief uh, context before we launch into the presentations from our incredible array of prize winners this year. Um, so um, just as Leslie mentioned, uh, the Incubator uh, has been going on for a couple of years. Uh, in 2015, uh, GSAP created the GSAP Incubator to support alumni who are developing new ideas and projects about architecture, contemporary culture, and the future of the city. And for four years, the Incubator was a co-working space at the New Museum's New Inc. in Lower Manhattan. Two of the main ideas of this initiative were first to create a kind of productive gray zone between school and the profession, and second to support expanded modes of practice. So the physical space at 231 Bowery created a pretty unique intersection of an educational institution, uh, Columbia, a cultural institution, the new museum, and a neighborhood that was overflowing with creativity, arts, and culture. And it blended a professional setting and a culture of entrepreneurship on the one hand with the communal creative energy and rigorous discourse of GSAP that students uh, experienced during their time at the university. During the first four years of the GSAP incubator, um, we hosted 131 members working on 59 different projects uh, coming from all of GSAP's different degree programs, alumni from all these different programs. Um, and the member groups developed a wide range of really interesting and cutting edge projects involving things like virtual reality and digital technology, also critical discourse and publishing, as well as civic issues and public spaces, urban regeneration, emergency response, uh, and beyond. Then in 2019, we transformed the GSAP Incubator as a physical space into the GSAP Incubator Prize in order to offer direct financial support to selected uh, recent alumni, both domestic and international. So transforming from a physical space to uh, direct financial support as a prize. But the ideas were still roughly the same. We wanted to support projects led by GSAP alumni that would br bridge uh, critical discourse with active practice and engagement. Um, and uh, we also want to support the idea of engaging uh, the challenges and opportunities that are facing the built environment today. Uh, the prize encourages a wide range of experiments while focusing on a very specific topic of inquiry each year. So in 2019, the first year, the school awarded six alumni prizes of $10,000 uh, $10, each to advanced projects dedicated to the theme of climate change at the business at the building scale climate change at the building scale and this uh, the project spanned uh, a range of approaches to tackling urgent environmental issues from material explorations to novel agricultural systems to resilient coastlines then in 2020 uh, this year's cycle uh, the prize was dedicated to the topic of climate, health, and cities. And GSAP awarded 16 alumni prizes to support projects spanning from critical discourse 
to reach research to active practice in architecture and its uh, related fields. And of course, you'll hear more about these projects in a few minutes. That's the main purpose of the event. Um, the last thing I'll mention, though, is that for 2021, for our upcoming cycle of the GSAP uh, Incubator Prize, 10 prizes will be granted to projects that advance racial equity in the built environment as outlined by the GSAP Anti-Racism Action Plan. Special consideration will be given to proposals serving Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, in particular projects that engage communities in Harlem. Uh, so if you want more information about that, you can um, see the call for proposals uh, online at the GSAP website. And with that, I will uh, pass it back to Leslie. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you, David. So tonight we have um, nine projects to hear from. Um, some of them uh, single presenters and some of them double presenters, but we will be splitting up the nine uh, projects in groups of three by theme. The first theme will be um, focusing on hidden infrastructures affecting health and well being. And the first pres presenter will be a uh, minor, uh, her, the name of her project is Urban Microenvironments. Miter, I think we might be seeing, there we go, great, perfect. Um, so hello everybody. Um, it's uh, I'm very happy to be back uh, in GSAP, even if it's uh, virtually, and very excited actually to uh, having awarded the Incubator Prize and, and be part of the event today. So I'm I'm an architect and also since very recently assistant professor at uh, UC Duvan in in Belgium, and the project that I'll be presenting today, as Leslie mentioned, is uh, called Urban Micro Environments. And it's a work that I've been developing in the last few months, like nearly to a year, that I started from a collaboration with uh, Professor Elie Busse from Princeton University and the student uh, Jean Shu. So my, my research focuses on, um, uh, just a second. Yeah. Um, focuses on the study of uh, the urban environment, uh, reacting in a way to the challenging urban health conditions that many cities uh, are facing today. So starting from uh, air quality to uh, microclimate issues related, for example, to the urban heat island effect. But while we very often hear about the insalubrious conditions in cities, um, rarely we talk about the, the special temporal gradients, the environmental special temporal gradients that characterize the urban environment. And this is something that maybe we have learned more about in the last uh, you know, one year and a half or during the pandemic when we've uh, seen uh, uh, very many news related to uh, how um, unevenly uh, you know, the death peaks uh, have been distributed across cities, very often related to also pollutant concentration levels in cities or the socio-demographic, so socio-economic parameters. Also through recent advancements in remote and direct sensing technologies, we have learned that environmental inequity is present in cities that within a block resolution, there can be a very large environmental uh, gradient. And so in this context, I come, uh, the research kind of evolved uh, with uh, some kind of big uh, or high level uh, questions and ambitions that I wanted to address. The first one being, what are the urban design, urban social demographic and building usage metrics that modulate the urban environmental gradients? So what do we do in the design of the city to make these gradients uh, happen? And how can we as designers become active in the study of urban environmental phenomena and the strategies to improve urban health? So the methodology for the research has been a data-driven uh, methodology. Uh, the first part uh, has been the compilation of, of data. Uh, data coming from two cities, in this case, I'll be presenting today, even though I'm looking into other cities as well. Uh, but um, 
so far I have been able to compile these uh, data sets. So data sets coming from socioeconomic uh, sources, urban design data sets, building usage data sets, and of course, environmental data. Um, I'll be presenting air, air temperature, air quality, land surface temperature, or relative humidity um, results related to these data sets. Then the data formatting steps are very uh, important. Uh, because um, I'm, I'll, I'll be, I have been looking into data sets that come from citizen science initiatives as well. And so um, for this type of data sets, it's very important uh, how you, you, you develop the data cleaning uh, process. So um, after, after kind of the data uh, formatting and, and compilation, of course, the data analysis uh, part uh, uh, was developed. In the data analysis part, initially, um, a multivariate regression analysis was uh, uh, developed using the environmental data as dependent variables and the remaining urban data sets uh, as uh, the independent variables to understand what, to understand what were the, the correlations. And then uh, also use those uh, you know, initial data sets that were considered um, uh, uh, useful uh, for the development of a predictive uh, model, for the training of a predictive model. And then um, applying that to, to some urban scenarios uh, that I'll be showing in a little bit in this case for New York City and LA and um, showing some visualizations of, of uh, some areas of the city, which I hope that uh, will trigger a, a discussion um, uh, here today. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm also looking into other cities. I'm looking into London and Seoul. And th the way I'm choosing cities is not really because I'm I'm interested in New York and uh, these other cities. But the reason is that there is a, a data availability for these cities. So high spatial temporal environmental data uh, was sought. So I have uh, listed like very many uh, data sets. I'll be pasting in a little bit uh, in the chat. Uh, a link to a story map uh, where if somebody is interested in looking into the data can go through and, and look uh, there. Uh, we'll be containing uh, these slides or these images and a little bit more information. But the two data sets that I wanted to highlight today are the ones related to air quality and microclimates. So to the left, uh, we're looking at the New York City Community Air Survey. So this is a quite comprehensive uh, sensing network in the city of uh, uh, New York that is collecting air quality and temperature data. This is a municipal uh, project. Um, and to the right, we are looking at the citizen science project, uh, the purple air stations distributed across LA. This is a picture I just took of the website uh, this morning. So uh, these are data sets that give us some location specific environmental data. Uh, so PM concentration, for example, temperature and relative humidity. And then we can use these locations to look into the urban environment around them and see whether there are correlations between the urban parameters that are contained within a boundary around these uh, the locations that we have data for and see whether these kind of parameters may be driving those concentration values either for uh, temperature or for uh, air contaminants. So this is what the initial method methodology has been, which I call a footprint based uh, regression analysis. Basically to the left, we see these footprints distributed in some of the stations in New York. And to the right, we see the same uh, in, in LA. And I did that for different footprints. So going from very little to uh, over uh, three kilometers uh, footprints to see where the correlations were happening at different footprints. I, I'm not gonna get into these details now. If again, somebody's interested, I can go back to the story map I'll be pasting. But through this analysis, what we get are the correlations uh, between the different uh, study parameters. Here, I'm just highlighting some of them. So on the left plot, we see the New York uh, correlation <coughs> um, of uh, some of the study parameters, again, in the middle for Los Angeles. And on the right-hand side here, we see a correlation uh, uh, with air quality as a dependent variable of some highlighted urban parameters that would, I thought would be interesting. To, uh, to highlight. So in general, um, the, both for New York and Los Angeles, we see that uh, the significant correlations, uh, positive correlations uh, are uh, between air quality and temperature and uh, building related parameters, that is building height, building volume, building area. 
and uh, also significant over 0 0.6 or around 0 0.6 minus 0 0.6 correlations against uh, greenery, three counts uh, NDVI uh, index. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, what I show is uh, a little bit what I'm describing. So this is again correlation in the y axis uh, with air quality um, with for building in the in the first kind of uh, uh, two bars uh, for, with greenery followed in the second uh, group, uh, third group income and fourth group population, New York being the green color and LA being the blue. And we can see that similar trends are observed in terms of the correlation between building uh, uh, volume, height, uh, floor plate area, and air quality for LA and New York. Same for greenery, uh, similar trends for population, even if there is a, a difference there. But for income, um, there is uh, a quite substantial difference. For LA, there is a high correlation uh, between income and a negative high correlation between income and air quality. And this is not the case for New York. Of course, we always have to kind of add a disclaimer that this is based on the training data we are using. And of course, if we change the training data, um, things may uh, vary a little bit, but this is uh, so far with quite a dense uh, station network what we are observing. Um, and uh, finally, for this kind of uh, plots, uh, uh, histogram um, distribution plots here to to understand uh, kind of the the variation in the parameters, some, some of the variation in the parameters that I think uh, are interesting to see. Uh, we are looking at population, the, the top left, uh, income uh, on the top right, uh, roads and uh, PM 2.5 below. I, I wanted to highlight at least the population one. We know that New York City is uh, uh, denser than, than LA. That's not a, a discovery. Um, we, again, we are looking at New York City in green and LA blue. And uh, the, the vertical breaks are, uh, mean the, are the mean and the median. But I'm identifying here uh, two possible ranges uh, for, uh, and I explain why this is uh, uh, important for the next step. Like for New York, I'll be considering that over 5,000 uh, uh, people within a 250 meter footprint will be like a, a high density uh, for the New York standards. While for LA, over 1,000 people within the same 250 uh, footprint will be considered uh, high density. And uh, the reason why I'm mentioning that uh, is because uh, for, uh, probably all of us have heard uh, many times that density is always highly correlated with contaminant, uh, 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 high air pollution uh, levels. And this is generally the case for both cities. Most of the, uh, you know, the, the, the temp high 10%, uh, highest 10% concentration levels are observed in these high dense uh, environments. Not always, but generally that's the case. But here, where I'm uh, marking with the circles, um, so you see the stations uh, colored by uh, based on the PM concentration value. And then with the white circles, I'm marking the high density points in the city. And with the crosses over the white uh, circles, there I'm marking the stations that we have data for that are high density, that, but that, however, have a below mean a PM concentration level. So an acceptable PM concentration level, let's say. And if we look at a zoom in of some of those locations, uh, like you, what you can see to the right hand side, uh, we observe that uh, these environments, while being uh, dense, so over 5,000 uh, people within this uh, footprint I mentioned, uh, they have a, a reasonable uh, PM concentration, so uh, not a high PM concentration for the city. And that's generally the case because they have a high uh, greenery fraction. And because very oftentimes the fabric is more uh, diverse, uh, both in heights and in the distribution, enabling this kind of ventilation of the city to happen. So these are only some of the examples where that is the case. For LA, the, the fabric characteristics are a little bit uh, more difficult to distinguish, but the greenery is certainly something that repeats uh, for the case where uh, the contaminant concentrations are low despite uh, the density. So here uh, in these plots, what I, um, what I did is select uh, some of the locations uh, for New York City. And now I'm gonna follow uh, with LA. 
So uh, the, the left top one uh, located in the Bronx and the, the left bottom one located in Brooklyn are two locations that are low dense, uh, uh, talking about population, so below 3,000 square footprint again. Um, however, they are amongst the highest uh, uh, highly polluted locations based on the NYCCAS uh, database. And here you can see how they are, these are locations with very uh, low NDVI, <coughs> uh, uh, high uh, uh, land surface temperature, uh, and you can also have a look at their uh, socioeconomic and, and health metrics. To the right hand on the right hand side on the on the other hand we we are looking at high density locations on the right top that's Chinatown that it's a um, a dense environment as you know uh, a typical uh, scenario where the fabric is quite homogeneous where uh, there is a high density uh, low uh, green fraction and uh, where the temperature and LSD is quite high and uh, the contaminant concentrations uh, also um, are, are high. And except the exception would be of one of those processes that I was marking in the, in the previous slides is uh, this one uh, uh, located nearby Rockefeller University on the bottom right that shows the highest uh, density population density of all instances over 8,000. Uh, people, however, it has a very high uh, green fraction and also is not very far from the from the water body that is enabling uh, those levels to to decrease. Similar plots for for LA. Uh, for the case of LA, um, all of the highly polluted locations um, are over 1,000 uh, in population. So here, what I'm showing is three instances that are the worst uh, uh, in terms of or amongst the, the 10 worst in terms of uh, PM concentration, which are the top left uh, the, the imperial town, then in South LA and in Mid City, all with uh, quite high LST. And uh, then we see a big drop uh, in PM concentrations when we go to urban environments where uh, there is a higher uh, greenery fraction, like the one we see in Hollywood Hills on the, on the bottom right. After uh, doing this kind of um, uh, hotspot analysis, uh, I started uh, developing a, a trajectory analysis of these uh, two locations, like uh, the, the model was, uh, I developed the model and then uh, the model was trained. So this was an opportunity to test the, the model in, in two different scenarios. Of course, there was uh, one model, uh, two models per C. And the one in, in New York, you see uh, on the uh, left hand side, this is a fraction of Broadway. So I'm using Broadway from uh, you know, the beginning uh, to the end. On the right hand side, we see a fraction of Sunset. So we have uh, Broadway Avenue and Sunset Boulevard to the right hand side. And in the same way as uh, with, the, with the air quality stations that I mentioned, the footprint based anal analysis was done. So every 250 meters, a footprint calculation is done of all the urban parameters. And then those are used as uh, predictors for the, the model to, to obtain the environmental data on air quality and um, uh, microclimate. So here we see some of the results and some of the, the parameters studied for Broadway. And same for, for Sunset. We can see that there are quite strong gradients. That's the reason why also these two trajectories were, were chosen quite strong. Uh, socioeconomic gradients, um, urban design gradients, and of course, environmental gradients as well. And there, would, there is also this kind of uh, echo of uh, Ed uh, uh, Ruska's uh, work on the Sunset Strip that uh, now we, in collaboration with uh, also an alumni from, from GIS at uh, Vienna Bogosian, we're developing uh, into a more uh, kind of elevation type of visualization of the environmental conditions that I modeled that I just described uh, in, uh, in the previous slides. So I think I'm gonna end up with this video. I have also another video for Sunset, but I can paste that in the, in the, in the chat because it's in the story map. And I think I'm already over my time. So um, if anybody wants to watch the Sunset one, um, uh, yeah, you can watch it uh, through the link. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Miter. Uh, I just.
people who don't know you, um, Maida received her PhD or earned her PhD from the Institute of Technology and Architecture, ETH Zurich. So I think we are, uh, we have a special treat today from um, all benefiting from all the research that she's done. She, she also recently joined the faculty at the School of Architecture at Northeastern University in Boston. In addition, she has a, sorry, I keep looking over here at my other screen. Uh, in addition, she has a practice with her partner in London. So she is definitely um, is sort of a global citizen um, and, and bringing all her expertise to us here. So thank you so much for taking this off today. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm sure we'll we'll be able to touch upon the intersections between your presentations and the next two, which take uh, shift gears um, intentionally just to make it more interesting to see how these different ways of investigation um, occur. We are going to hear from Eduardo now, who graduated last year. Um, the name of his project. Sorry, I've lost my screen now. Uh, the name of his project is uh, Country Sewers, From the Home to the Town. Thank you, Eduardo. Okay. Oh, let me start that. Okay. Oh, thank you, Leslie. I'm really glad to kind of be back and share with you guys uh, some of the things that I've been looking at over the past few months. Um, and so my project uh, for this iteration of the Incubator Prize is very much a, um, I guess, a continuation of some of the last year at GSAP um, and some of those ideas of how can we address issues outside of architecture kind of with architecture. And in a nutshell, what I've been looking at are maybe ways and kind of models for addressing smaller towns that have failing sewer systems and um, what, are, what are ways we can kind of remedy those. And kind of like a lot of things, this project of mine started with YouTube, you know, big shout out to the algorithm. Um, and I had come across a series of videos on a particular part of Alabama, it's Black Belt, which is in the South, that kind of all focused on this particular place, Uniontown, that is sort of suffering from various, I guess, years of sort of neglect in where there are systems that are meant to deal with treating sewage um, are kind of failing at the moment. And so I'd kind of gone through a lot of these videos um, and kind of picking up things uh, to try and figure out maybe where to begin. Um, and one thing sort of about what they have down there rather than maybe what a lot of us are used to um, with machines and sort of chemicals that treat the stuff that we flush. Instead, they have sort of large lagoons and pools that then distribute that um, sewage out to sort of the grass and the land, but because of their soil makeup, it doesn't really allow for that. And so what in turn you get is sort of what's shown on the screen here where a lot of the thing, the sewage that's sort of sprayed out ends up pulling up to the surface. And so now I'm just gonna play a clip from one of the videos I had watched um, that kind of details some of their troubles. We have had some serious issues with our sewage. And this has been going on for decades, decades. And that's, that never should have happened. The sewer pipes that are supposed to take everything from all the houses, they carry all of that material to a lagoon. The lagoon has three cells where basically the material is supposed to get treated along the way. And then once it passes its way through the lagoon, it gets pumped to what's called a spray field, which is exactly what it sounds like. Most of the time in a spray field, it's supposed to get absorbed back into the ground or evaporate into the air. In Uniontown, the soil has so much clay in it that the water just doesn't percolate. Where you're supposed to have a field with grasses where the water is gently absorbed, basically you just have a pond. And that pond, every time it rains, is just completely inundated. The lagoon dam have burst. And it so I'll stop that there and kind of continue. But um, we have had the older gentleman in the uh, 
video is Benny and he's a member, he's a resident of Uniontown and also a member of a community organization there. And kind of a big thing, I had a chance to speak with him um, and what some of the research has been kind of, well, what are other solutions at the scale of the town to maybe address some of this? Um, and a lot of what they're doing and what he's doing is kind of collecting those stories, collecting some of the work that they've been doing to advocate for themselves, to try and kind of shed light on their plight and try and get some, I guess, attention, but also um, real sort of solutions to what they're dealing with. And one of those sort of came across in 2018 um, where they received a large, large amount of money to kind of begin to take on, well, how could they fix their busted lagoons? And in the simplest terms, what they've come up with at the moment is to kind of just pipe their sewage from Uniontown to another city in Alabama. Um, and kind of a takeaway that I've had after speaking with Ben and looking at some of these um, bits of information on the project is sort of how difficult it is to get clear cut sort of plans and know exactly what's going on. One of the sites that that can be found on is this department site in Alabama, it's kind of a record of a lot of permit documents, a lot of reports, and sort of correspondence on the kind of status of the project. This is kind of one of those things that they have. A just brief summary of kind of where the status of the project is. Um, this is sort of an ongoing thing. And so it's kind of tough to find, to know exactly what is sort of happening here. Um, and so in light of that, but also the kind of strange year that this has been. I've tried to kind of recalibrate the project a bit uh, to maybe step outside of Alabama, maybe look locally, or to just look at other places that are kind of going through similar issues. And um, where that sort of landed me um, is kind of closer to New York. There's a small town just across the Hudson, Oakland in New Jersey that is also undergoing a sort of similar project to reroute their sewage from their sort of small town to another place that has the facilities to handle it. And then so, I don't know, I'm thinking that maybe the project is changing, sort of evolving from my initial idea of kind of making up some new solution to kind of connecting pieces between places. And then so on here are two maps that I had kind of made um, on the left is one that I made to apply for the incubator prize. And on the right is a newer one of New Jersey, kind of just looking at the land cover, what kind of takes up each place. The kind of red parts are the sort of more populated places. The green parts are kind of the more rural, um, less developed areas. And then sort of along that, maybe what are some uh, ways to look at the use of the land with where people are sort of live and where they're distributed. Um, and so, so those are some of the things that I've been trying to guess, uh, deal with and come to terms with as far as, well, if there are solutions out there, how can we kind of connect people who have different um, maybe locations, but are still undergoing the same issues. And to kind of maybe get to the scale of the home, I'm still sort of obsessed, I guess, with this idea partially guys, because, you know, just a year out of school, but um, I think this is also maybe something where a traditional model could come into play. And then so at the scale of the house, there are a lot of homes, not only in Alabama, but across the country that have on-site septic um, treatment, where it's sort of the same idea where what you flush in the toilet is collected into a tank and that's then distributed. Um, but again, in some of these places in Alabama, the, they don't work because of the soil. And what you get is, um, what you get in turn are where it pulls up just outside of people's homes. And this has led to sort of a number of health issues with people who live there. Um, and it's not an easy fix, one, because of the soil, but also because these things aren't super cheap. They're kind of an expensive um, endeavor. And so, also in the kind of recalibration of the project and looking outward at different prototypes and models as this program in Suffolk County, that's in Long Island, you know, just out here in New York that they have kind of at the county level, a program set up to try and help people upgrade their older 
systems into something newer, different technology. And a part of that has me thinking, well, what are ways that that can maybe infiltrate um, the idea of a home? This is just a trace of a kind of home that could be made in a factory, a kind of typical floor plan layout. Um, and these last few images to kind of end are just me again, kind of in that mindset of being in school, thinking through image making. Um, and so in what ways could a typical septic system that's in the ground and kind of connected to a home, could other ways that that could maybe come out of it, other ways that it could maybe become one with the home, considering that it's sort of made in a factory, other other sort of models of thinking about how that could come together. Um, and so as much as this has been a kind of quick progress report of things that I've looked at and where I've come from so far, I guess it's also sort of like a long-winded help wanted ad. You know, I'm very much open to hearing and gathering things from other people who may be watching now, who may watch in the future, um, any guidance, information, um, to shoot the breeze really, you know. Uh, I'm always down to hear more about what other people have to say about this. Um, but with that, I think I'll end uh, this and I'll pass it over to the next. Thank you, Eduardo. It's so nice to see how um, your your research has evolved. Um, and please uh, type your Gmail address into the chat just for people to like be able to copy and paste easier. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that right now. And next we'll have um, two graduates from last year as well, uh, this time from the Critical Curatorial and Conceptual Practice program, Zoe and Alexandra. Hi, thanks, Leslie. Um, I'm Alex. Hi, I'm Zoe. Um, and as Leslie mentioned, we're both graduates of the CCCP program from 2020. Um, and this year we've been researching the seminal American myth of the home as refuge. We are experimenting with video as a medium to work through our questions as we hope to make visible how the built environment, just like cinema, is a project of power and control. The expectation to be home so much this year illustrates the idea that home is a safe space, that it provides shelter from outside dangers. And while these are simple physical truths, they are also emotionally loaded ideas. In order to explore safety as an architectural phenomenon then, we need to turn to affect as a framework to understand how the feeling and desire for safety is bound up with the architecture of the home. Historically, popular anxieties about the post-industrial metropolis have been a pretext for getting tough on America's poor and dismantling social welfare instead of investing in public infrastructure. This pattern doesn't just immiserate those in need and exacerbate the wealth gap, but also redirects our political consciousness. Once we internalize individual responsibility, we lose sight of the need and desire for political organization and instead take comfort in finding solutions to our own problems. Wearing a mask and staying home are methods to protect and take care of our communities, but they have been framed as self-protection this past year from the possibility of you giving me the virus rather than the other way around. This self-motivated messaging doesn't just isolate us from community and care, but also from solidarity. The state gets to be relieved of its responsibility rather than be held accountable. This cycle of depoliticization exacerbates the disintegration of the social safety net, which alongside a media infatuation with danger have contributed to a climate of fear that we see as inextricably linked with the desire to have the home as a refuge. In a climate of fear, can the home ever live up to the expectation of home in the American imaginary? American faith and domestic bliss means believing that safety is always just one fix or one Lysol wipe away. Over the past year, we have followed this endless chase for home comfort 
through moral panic, ecological threats, debt, decorating, and the racialized and gendered politics of home, home ownership and home maintenance. As historians, our project is rooted in the archives. When we set out to begin, we intended to source material from the Vanderbilt Television Archives, the Oscar Newman Archives at Avery, and the New York Historical Society, to name a few. Though we were able to access parts of these collections remotely, much of the material we hoped to see had not been digitized, so archival material often felt at an arm's distance. Instead, we turned to media we could find online news clips and advertisements, home videos, security footage, YouTube channels, PSAs, government sponsored videos, and the wonderful genre of shelter TV. These media types all had a sort of predictable tone and texture where everything felt staged. Um, we realized that the arm's length that we felt with the archival material was not just because of pandemic restrictions, but was actually ingrained in the material itself. The socio-political threads that we have been chasing, like privatization, atomization, and the fortification of the home, themselves act as distancing measures. The superficial quality of the media was a feature and not a bug. And embracing that meant working experimentally to critically analyze our source media. So we started putting together short videos responding to our research themes as a semi-weekly exercise. This process has helped us begin to articulate some of our theoretical ideas and let us practice our editing software. While it's just one clip out of many, we thought we would share one of our processual experiments to illustrate how we've been working this year. The modern home cannot be thought without the television. In the mid 20th century, the TV entered the home as a new kind of window, not onto the immediate surroundings or the neighbor's yard, but brought into the living room a whole array of alternative environments, broadcast studios, sound stages, and the interiors of others' homes. A doctor named Edith Farnsworth was living inside an all glass Mies van der Rohe designed residence. She described her experience the truth is that in this house with its four walls of glass, I feel like a prowling animal, always on alert. I am always restless. I feel like a sentinel on guard day and night. The house comprised entirely of windows is one that causes problems. Hypervisibility, fear of voyeurism, lack of privacy and security that one might tend to think home should provide. Television and windows share this quality. Looking out goes hand in hand with looking in. Along with the TV into the home came the TV cameras. The home was forever transformed into a place of potential, if not actual, televisual performance. This feeling of being watched at home wavered between the realms of entertainment and security until the two became indistinguishable. Well, a man came to our house, our house, our house. A man came to our house to sell us some brooms. So we asked him to come in, and we hit him with a hammer, and we hit him in the closet in my father's room. But you're always welcome in our house any time of the day. Yes, you're always welcome in our house, and we hope you will stay. Then a lady came to our house, our house, our house. A lady came to find out why I was not in school. So we asked her to come in, and we gave her some poison lemonade and hid her in the freezer where it's nice. But you're always welcome in our house Any time of the day Yes, you're always welcome in our house And we hope you will stay Then the kid came into our yard, our yard, our yard The kid came into our yard to get his ball 
we asked him to come in and we took him in the basement and we sealed him up inside the basement wall. But you're always welcome in our house any time of the day. Yes, you're always welcome in our house and we hope you will stay. <laughs> We will have some fun. We will ask you to come in, and we will take you in the kitchen. We will put you in the oven until you are done. But you're always welcome in our house any time of the day. Yes, you're always welcome in our house, and we hope you will stay. The modern home can um, so the clip that Alex played is um, it's, is not our final product, but rather a documentation of our process this past year. We're still scratching the surface of the ideas we hope our film and film practice can ultimately explore. Um, and we plan to continue this project past the end of this incubator cycle and beyond the landscapes of our homes. With archives reopening, we're eager to return to our initial case studies with the theoretical framework we've built this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex and Zoe. I know that was um, a new medium for you guys, and I, I'm I'm happy that uh, we had the pleasure of seeing the first uh, presentation of it. If I could ask the um, presenters to just turn on their cameras for a brief, we're going to take a pause now between presentations for a brief discussion. Um, sorry, the the last project. Uh, presenters. So Mitre, Eduardo, Zoe, and Alexandra. Um, I was, uh, I, I thought that it was so interesting and representative of the programs um, at GSAP to see the range in just three projects of the types of investigative methods and how you were all able to pivot during this very strange a uh, year. I know uh, Miter has prepared a, a question to kick off the discussion. If uh, well, uh, not really prepared, but uh, yeah. Um, so uh, it's a it's a thought. Uh, may, maybe that I, um, I I wanted to know uh, what your thoughts are more than related to a particular project. Is uh, on related to the title of uh, hidden infrastructures, right? Um, and it is true uh, on my topic, but I, I think also in yours, so for, for three of us, that um, one of the main issues of these topics is that, you know, it's very difficult for, for us as designers or for anybody really to get a sense of what is happening. Uh, uh, they are complex phenomena in, in many ways. Uh, the data sets are very, you know, uh, diverse in different formats. Uh, uh, so uh, how do you see you know, our role as designers um, in, in, in this context? Uh, you know, the, what is the role of visualization, for example? How can we, you know, um, in, in my particular field, um, developing visualizations of uh, urban microclimatology, for example, uh, can, can bring along you know, discussion uh, possibilities or can bring along um, uh, even uh, engagement with citizens, right? Um, uh, civic uh, uh, engagement, and so how how do you see this in your projects, or how what do you, what do you think it, our role is in this context? That's it. Really great question. Um, 
and a lot to think about, especially in terms of all of the projects. And, and Eduardo, I really liked something that you said in your presentation about like learning to, or thinking through visuals, which I think has really been part of our process as well. Um, and working in film, which is, which as Leslie mentioned is a new medium for uh, Zoe and I. And so thinking about um, the different, particularly emotional resonance that um, film can bring to people um, as a method of understanding like architecture and design has been really interesting in our process um, that, yeah, it feels like a, a, a different sort of um, engagement with what like a visual architectural practice can do. And so I know that's been really exciting. Um, for Zoe and I over this last year is is to really sort of push what the um, yeah the visual capabilities of um, communication in architecture are and what what those boundaries are and sort of pushing against those. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think for me. Um... I think a lot of what I guess I learned was how to kind of get a lot of things together and then maybe figure out what things go together, what things don't go together, and maybe how to sort of draw connections to it. I th like, um, I don't know, just like a very advanced kind of strainer, just like how do we kind of parse through all of these different things um, and kind of make something of it that kind of drives a narrative. Um, and I guess that's part of my question for, I guess, you all as well is like, we've kind of been stuck at home and we've kind of had to get creative in the ways that we get information and even the things that we get are maybe not exactly what we might have envisioned to begin with. And I'm wondering um, for you all, if that's maybe changed what you've made. Like, so for example, um, uh, maybe not for example, but just maybe it's not the ideal kind of data or information or sort of photos and archival material and has that in turn maybe changed the kind of products you I guess make as a result of that um, I, I'm not sure if I um completely un understand uh, the, the question, but I mean, for me, the, the situation has uh, changed the, the, the research methodology a little bit, uh, but uh, I don't think I'm answering your question, but yes, the, the way you, you engage with data, I think uh, for me has changed. Uh, usually I do more like, um, uh, you know, like sensing experiment and, and so on. In this case, I was using uh, more available data. So in a, in a way, I got a better sense of the data set that is uh, out there, how these are formatted, how, you know, the openness of data in different cities. Uh, so in a way, you are isolated, but you are more aware of uh, the global scenario. So for me, it, it made the project uh, you know, more uh, just by, I started looking at any city that had data while in other, in other scenario, I would be uh, looking into what is happening in the city where I am to, to, to study the, the local environment. So that isolation made the whole, uh, you know, research field or research um, scale uh, become much larger. But I don't think I'm answering uh, your question exactly. Well, I mean, that's fine. I think yeah. that gets to kind of the point um, and just like how we have to kind of adapt. I mean, both of your projects are kind of like we're in that moment, I think. Um, but it's going to be super interesting to see how they can evolve when you sort of are able to leave that sort of restricted but open kind of um, scenario. Yeah, to, I, if I... I can jump in um, sort of tying both your questions together. I feel like uh, initially um, we had wanted to work with uh, a lot of formal archival material, um, which is is so rich, um, you know, always. And 
uh, a, a part of one of the reasons we wanted to work with that in, in particular some of the, the video material that's in, in Avery is because um, we are, topic is super big and um, I think we're we're interested in uh, as much a kind of public audience as we are the kind of academic architectural audience and and um, narrowing our uh, our sort of yeah who we were addressing to the community that we're really in um, and so yeah just trying to kind of poke holes or push on ideas within um, um, the academy or, or within sort of architecture as as a plummeting um, ourselves and trying to um, yeah be really conscientious that we're not going to be you know, making a, a film that speaks to everybody or that even reaches everybody and so um, thinking about our uh, what both the like how our brains, also the communities that we're in. Um, yeah, just really trying to keep it focused on speaking within within architecture. Um, and so, yeah, it's been interesting to still try to do that without using academic archives. But um, I, I think we'll, we'll we'll keep going with what we're working with, and then more as archives open. And YouTube, very very important, as I know it was to you, Eduardo, as well. Yeah, the algorithm. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for exploring these issues around health and well-being. Um, when when the theme was announced for for this year, you know, it, it was just um, who knew how rich the real life could uh, be in the way that it, uh, each of your projects um, must have been informed this year. So thank you. And I, I hope you do continue your research in this direction. I know it was a challenging year um, to, to develop the projects. So we welcome you back in, uh, in the future for updates. Um, to speaking of this year, I mean, we, we know how important community always is, but particularly this year, the empowerment of community and the how we define our own communities has been especially important. Um, so this next group of presenters are going to be talking about their projects that are powered by community. Uh, starting with the project Lots of People. So Anat and Ela from the AUD program will be presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone. So uh, this is the project we're working on, uh, Ela and me. Uh, it's called uh, Lots of People and actually it started in the summer semester of uh, the urban design program uh, last year and we really liked this project and actually the incubator gave us the opportunity to kind of like take it one step further and kind of refine the research and, and kind of like uh, uh, make it happen hopefully in real life as well. So the project is dealing uh, with the increase of population in cities and the lack of open space per capita. And at the same time, we identified a lot of um, privately owned vacant lots, uh, around 18,400 that are waiting to be built, but um, for now they're just empty um, in the middle of the city. Um, we'll share with you a short video that we uh, prepared that basically summarized the project. Something for the kids. They don't have anything. That's why they doing bad things, selling drugs and all that stuff. There are a lot of empty lots that are just like seem to just be taking up space and no one's using them for anything. Have a little recreation or something where they can play pool and play all video games and stuff like that. We can utilize these spaces. They need to fix it. They need to call my book, fix all the holes around here too. So with that being said. It can be some things that can be used besides building more condoms for people in this area to not be able to live in. And they can utilize these spaces for sprinklers, they can use it for a pool, they can use it for like an arcade. They can use it for something to give the children something to do rather than not having things for these kids to do so people can talk about them. They're making it unaccessible for people to use the stuff in their own community. 
for it to still be a problem while my kids is grown is an issue that needs to be addressed. Okay, so this is kind of summarized the project and we kind of like uh, tell a bit more about that. So we look at the population projection in New York City and as you can see, according to the report of uh, Department of City Planning, uh, Brooklyn and uh, Manhattan especially has like a growth rates of population. Um, at the same time, we look at the open space uh, per individual in different cities uh, around the US. And you see, for example, Washington 55 square meter per individual. And we see that New York is pretty uh, kind of low in that. So Obviously, there is a need to kind of more um, open space in the city. Um, and then when we looked in data about like privately owned vacant lots in the city, we found 18,400 uh, lots, vacant lots in New York City, which is um, total was 13.4 million um, square meter, which is just to give you kind of a scale, it's like four times of Central Park. So of course, we don't say that we need to take all of that, but there is a lot of potential in those kind of empty spaces. And then we came up to this kind of idea of like creating the platform of kind of borrowing private vacant lots uh, to be used for the community and kind of a temporary uh, use um, for the amenities uh, to give to the people. So basically, as you saw in the video, it's like start when there's a vacant lots that are available for like, you know, a month, 10 months, a year, it's been there. And someday there will be a permit, but in the meantime, we think there is like opportunity to kind of borrow this space with a kind of like a policy uh, that basically the community could benefit from it. So we came up with different uh, design interventions. This is just like examples. And of course, when we have a lot, we'll, uh, we tend to kind of do a pilot project and um, look, ask the community exactly the amenities that they need in order to, to kind of occupy the lot. But this is just ideas of what we can do in those lots, like pop-up play, um, and different kind of library use. Uh, this example we kind of collected that with very kind of low budget and very basic, um, you know, uh, materials, we can uh, create those um, interventions. For example, uh, paint and graffiti as kind of design tool to create a kind of a, um, a basketball court or vegetation that uh, could help also for uh, kind of like more shading or even kind of uh, temporary structures. And this is like the design toolkit that we made from small, medium, large to extra large. And it could be kind of outdoor gym and it could be kind of a movie nights, uh, you know, uh, place that uh, um, screening video for the community. 
And while we were articulating these kind of interventions, we thought of different kind of like audience. So it could be something maybe more small scale to the children, maybe kind of more uh, soft scape uh, if you want to kind of uh, have more kind of a park or community garden, uh, maybe more privacy if you want kind of a reading place. Um, and as you saw, this is kind of like just an example of how this kind of lot could be occupied. And also we're thinking how you assemble and disassemble very easy. So it could, should be like, you know, a kit of fire that you just come with a truck, put that, and after like five months or something like that, just disassemble that. And while we were looking at intervention, we thought how we can, you know, address also the climate strategies, uh, create the climate uh, strategies inside project, for example, in, because we know that like uh, their uh, heat island effect, maybe we can, you know, create more shading like uh, with shade structures or collecting water and use it as kind of a mist or cooling system, or even like community gardens create this kind of a hydrophonic uh, system uh, in terms of like even education for, for the communities. Um, in terms of policy and stakeholders, we see it as like a win-win situation. So of course the municipality could gain more public space to, um, you know, um, use and give for, for the different communities. The developer, first of all, kind of like uh, bring back to the community where he's going to build and get incentives from the municipality and basically also increase the value of the lot when it's just empty now. And in terms of community, of course, this is the, the most uh, beneficiary of this, um, this thing that it's kind of uh, create more public space and also uh, um, be engaged in what is going to be built in your neighborhood. Um, so just quickly how it works, so the community has a need, they ask the municipality if they have a space, great, but if it doesn't have space, then they go to privately owned lots, hopefully with kind of tax incentives of real estate taxes and property taxes, uh, the community can borrow the lot until the permit is, uh, in, uh, and the, until the permit is uh, um, get and then uh, uh, bring it back to the developer. We do see a potential to have kind of a POPs, like a privately owned uh, public spaces in those lots that maybe a remain of this idea will, you know, be keeping to the community as a community garden or even amenity on the ground floor. But this is, of course, kind of up to the developer. Um, in terms of implementation, so we understand that we cannot start with the policy. So it's a more kind of bottom up approach. We need to find a pilot project and then we see it expanding to kind of a network in the city. So in order to find the first pilot project, we kind of did uh, research about like the most population, uh, populated um, areas uh, in New York City, of course, Manhattan and Brooklyn. Then we kind of break it out into neighborhoods and you saw Bed-Stuy, um, Brownsville, Lower East Side, Harlem. These are kind of potential uh, places for uh, intervention. We also kind of overlap that with the in, uh, low income areas uh, in order to understand how we can, th these are places that really need those open spaces. And these are kind of like overlap with the specific neighborhood that we choose. And then we overlay that with the vacant lots. So all these vacant lots inside um, those boundaries, we kind of uh, map that and create a list of 4,600 lots. And we're in the process of sending kind of emails and reach out to the developers. We have the owner name, we have like the company, the area, and we create this kind of one pager to kind of reach out to people and try to, to see where we can, you know, create this first um, intervention. Uh, we also went on site, uh, this is for example in Brooklyn, to understand which lots are more easy to kind of address uh, in terms of like, you know, topography and accessibility. Um, and yeah, let's go to the logistics as well. So in terms of logistics, we did some research on liability, sponsors and documentation requirements. First, if we want to build some temporary structures or have events that take place on private property, then we might need this temporary use and structure permit from New York Department of Buildings. The application process usually will take four to six weeks. And if there is any other types of activities, such as plaza events, mobile units, or fairs, we might need some extra permits. And in next page, in order to protect the properties, negotiating and coordinating different services and security issues, we will need different kinds of liability insurance, depending on the type and duration of the pop-ups. Also in some big private entities, they can provide some sponsorships and support for public goods programs that we are trying to apply and reach out to them, see if we can get any sponsorships from these big uh, private entities. 
And we are also looking on collaboration with local bees and nonprofits to see if we can get more connections with developers or landowners, which can give us more support and help to our first pilot project. And in the community engagement aspect, we have been to downtown Brooklyn, Lower East Side, Brownsville, and Bed Study and did interviews and asked what do people think about vacant lots in their communities. Once we got a pilot site, we can definitely have more specific community engagement activities and let people speak out and share their thoughts. For instance, we intend to hang like a big canvas in the community and people can just come do though and draw their ideas on the canvas, talk with us about their concerns or interests. And moreover, uh, we create a website of pop-ups design competition so people can share their thoughts, their needs, and design ideas for vacant lots. Through this website, we can also know the specific problems they have and what kinds of programs residents want. The website can also be a good platform for developers to get inspirations and receive more different thoughts about what they can really do to their vacant lots. Since last November, we have been refining the narrative and research, reaching out to professionals from public to private sectors. And in this year, we talked with more people such as developers, landowners, communities, nonprofits, etc. And we are looking for more potential pilot projects and trying to find a nice lot to be our first pilot site from thousands of vacant lots in New York City. So if you want to be involved or have any ideas for a vacant lot, please contact us with this two email address. Let's make it happen and make our city a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let me ask you, you as well to drop your um, email addresses in the chat for people. Um, and Ela, you, you ended with a great line for a segue to uh, Sean's presentation, makeithappen.city. Um, I think Ela and Inat's uh, project sparked our imagination about what is possible. And uh, I think Sean will be presenting a tool that he is developing um, to make those, those imaginations possible. Sean, I think you might be muted. So, can you see my screen right now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so at the core of urban planning is the mission of creating a collective vision for our cities um, and how we'd like to live and then working to allocate resources and energy towards these ideals. To create a truly shared and equitable future it is essential that we take part in shaping and executing this vision. In 2019 and 2020, I developed the Make It Happen platform to address shortcomings in the community engagement process. I'd identified from over a decade working in community development and urban planning and from my studies while at GSAP. I focused particularly on comprehensive plans, extensive blueprints for the future of places that all too often wind up sitting on back office shelves. One of my main goals was to open up this process and eventual product by tackling the above issues. I began using this platform to collect public data and conduct interactive visioning sessions in communities around New York. I was able to test various methods of data collection, QR codes, in-person versus digital, et cetera, to see which approaches might yield the furthest reach and detail. With the input of prior surveys, the public was then guided through brainstorming exercises to get goals, uh, identified priorities, and also outline next step toward achieving these goals. Uh, here's a sample of one of the uh, previous dashboards. All these ideas were then added in real time to the platform where residents could continue to expand, act upon these goals, and track how initiatives impacted the community, both during these initial meetings and any time thereafter. Uh, here's another picture of expanding on one of the local goals that was developed. Uh, just as the platform was gaining momentum, however, the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, forced all typical planning efforts to a halt. Prospective city clients faced budget uncertainties or media cutbacks, and everyday survival became the most pressing concern for most people. Uh, in response to this crisis, the platform was briefly recalibrated to try and help address acute issues. 
first by aggregating possible solutions to the COVID-19 crisis, and then by helping with grassroots efforts, uh, mutual aid efforts, such as mapping and encouraging the creation of uh, community fridges throughout New York City. But like many others, all the chaos and dysfunction of 2020 revealed the larger system in crisis, with cracks that have been brewing coming to the surface. Rather than returning to normal, it has become clear that we need a new, a better system moving forward, one that is far more resilient, equitable, and empowering. In order to create a better system, the above three steps are essential. First, we need to create a clear idea of where we'd like the UID to be going. Such a vision needs to be both specific, specific and compelling. Next, we need to be able to take action toward these ideals. Such efforts can be an after, can't be an afterthought. It should be embedded in everyday actions and as widespread as possible for their implementation. We cannot just rely on a handful of agencies or organizations to change course from our current destructive trajectory. Lastly, we need, all, we need to do this all in a way that allows us to increasingly operate independently from the constraints of the current system. If many of our collective goals are neutral or even at odds with our current modes of production, we need to create new ones. To reach the scale needed for systemic change, the platform leverages an open source slash peer production type of model. Where the majority of content is generated and governed by the users themselves, similar to projects like Wikipedia or the Linux operating system. This kind of distributed production model is both a means and an intended end for the project as well, creating a system where power is far more equitably shared. To begin, the platform is largely based around pursuing more ideal conditions for nine major goal areas. Uh, these are very similar to the UN Sustainable Development Goals or other alternatives to GDP for measuring societal well being. These goal areas include categories like knowledge and education, economy and livelihood, et cetera. For each category, the platform then looks at what any community would like to have ideally. For example, everyone would like to have a good work life balance. The user profiles and surveys, which will be shown shortly. And by pulling in other data sets, the idea is to establish a set of baseline metrics that are constantly updated to guide our priorities, with the goal of having every community reach 100% satisfaction with each. Each of these goal sets also strive to maximize local sufficiency, resilience, and equity. Lastly, for all these goals, the platform aggregates the best solutions available and prompts users to adapt these solutions in their communities and everyday lives. In addition, users are prompted to share these solutions, work, how they work for them, and where there might be room for improvement, functioning as an open solutions toolkit. These solutions are also regularly shared throughout the network and in daily blasts in order to provide constant positive feedback. In order to maximize the platform's reach, for most people would be marketed as a place to work on, a, not on a city's plan, but as a place to work on their own dream world. For each user, their experience will be customized given their personal goals, and the platform can help them discover expand upon and work toward these goals. Given the user selections, they are led through a series of steps to further identify their goals and create plans of action. Among these different possible steps, all users are encouraged to go through a profile quiz that helps them to create their ideal world. A set of questions prompts uh, gathers much of the key data mentioned earlier for the local indices. The idea is to present these questions in a simple and even fun way to make the eventual goals more meaningful to the users. As more information is gathered about each user, they are matched to additional goals and encouraged to start versions of successful goals in their own communities, with many of these shared goals helping them to accomplish their own personal goals as well. All these goals are, and relative well being indexes are gathered on the user's dashboard, and all shared goals are on the community dashboards shown earlier. This kind of central command, partnered with carefully timed prompts and notifications, helps the users follow through with their own goals, stay connected to shared goals over time. Next, for every goal created on the platform, the user is guided through each step of project development, triggering different tools and interactions at different times. Uh, like a game, the user is encouraged to unlock next steps to add necessary details to their goals. They are specifically encouraged to build the impact value of their goal, especially, essentially by tagging the targets mentioned in the vision section earlier to these goals and specifying slash quantifying the potential impact of their goal. This whole process can help figure out personal goals they'd otherwise struggle to find such a range of support for, and also helps form a strong pipeline for new projects and businesses, as people can essentially vet, validate, and flesh out their projects before having to seek conventional investment. As tasks are identified, the creator of the goal can start flagging certain tasks for broader community support. This could range from advice, tools, physical space, or even larger time commitments of work. An internal credit system helps determine which tasks will receive greater support from the overall community. A task is highly valued and more visible throughout the platform if it comes from a high impact goal, or if a user decides to boost that task by using some of their credit. 
Such tasks are also matched to users with complementary skills, goals, et cetera. Helping to address these highly valued tasks in turn give other users credit, which they can then use to highlight their own tasks. This personal credit also dissipates over time, encouraging everyone on the platform to keep uh, doing good deeds and preventing excess power accumulation by any individual. The system is similar to old peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems like Mapster, rewarding people who contribute to the community as they can then draw on the community more for greater support. Not only does this credit system strive to embody a new system of valuation, essentially by internalizing externalities and ex economic exchanges, but it also aims to make public participation more equitable by rewarding and helping those who might not otherwise have the luxury or free time to engage in community development activities. Lastly, the platform works to make it easier for us all to create more positive outcomes outside the current constraints of our system moving forward. As shown in previous slides, the first step is finding alternatives for goals that might otherwise have excessive barriers to entry, expertise, resources, et cetera. This then reduces dependence on solely securing conventional capital to turn ideas into realities. Next, some financing will often be needed for goals beyond a certain scale. Again, the platform provides alternatives by allowing users to tap into crowdfunding, as well as an upcoming revolving loan fund that will invest in high impact projects. Given all the community vetting and validation, such loans will have a greater degree of security than usual as well. In the upcoming release, users are also encouraged to join cooperative institutions during the gold discovery process, like community support agriculture farms, credit unions, et cetera. In the future, the aspiration is to set up a network between these cooperatives to better share and pool resources, something like a digital version of the cooperative cluster in Mondragon, Spain. Lastly, even though the current uh, vision framework, goals that create uh, lastly, even through the current, current vision framework, goals that create local self-sufficiency and resilience are especially valued. Gaining independence in energy production, local flexible manufacturing capacity, et cetera, would be game changers for local economic development. Such projects will have preference through the loan fund and the tools will be developed to facilitate their development moving forward. Uh, thanks to the G7 Incubator, I was able to partner with additional designers and developers to create the next version of the platform, which will be launching in the summer, uh, this summer, 2021. Uh, if you're interested in being a test user or collaborating in any way, please feel free to shoot me an email at info at makeithappen.city. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sean. That is really exciting. Um, and please just put your email um, in the chat for people to be able to copy and paste. Um, and I'm excited to introduce Rafaela and Ernesto, who are uh, speaking from Chile today uh, about the communities in, in their region. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. We are very happy to be here. I'm very excited to share ah, the presentation. Sorry. <laughs> So very, we are very excited to share and discuss the different proposals with you today. So as Leslie said, my name is Rafael Olivares and I graduated from the AID in 2020. Along with me is Ernesto Silva, AID class of 2013. We are partners in an architectural firm called Estudios in Apellido, and we are interested in investigating everyday situations where there are, seems to be no architecture but where there are different systems that can inform the generation of architectural projects. Hello, everyone. Our research project is framed within the study of a specific uh, urban typologies of Chilean popular culture, with the aim of developing a catalog that defines the guidelines to generate an evolution of daily activities into a design project. Typology is a way of classifying architecture in and is used to design by us architects to this day. Architecture is not only described by types, it is also produced through them. Architectural projects are commonly identified within a precise type because it is the form we have commonly known. Ernesto, I hate to interrupt you, but I just want to let you guys know that we're seeing the version of your screen that has, it's uh, not full screen shared oh, right now. Uh, so i just wanted to make sure that we got the the there image you. that you wanted us to see one small second um there perfect okay thank you very Great. much thank you um, 
Uh, we define non-typology as the combination of different types in the same ecosystem in which there are certain scenarios and relationships that call, call our attention because of what happens in them and because of the relationships that take place between the different typologies. Everyday situations and uses that are informing programmatic relationships that challenge pre-establish organizations and systems. In other words, that challenge the very notion of typology. As an example, within this idea of non-typologies, we present today our case study made up of a soccer field, a community center, and a square. These are the urban typological elements that have conditioned most of the public spaces on Chilean popular neighborhoods. These are the spaces where interaction between people takes place, thus enabling an idea of community in which leisure, sports, entertainment, and cooperation happen. We started studying this phenomenon a few years ago, documenting these three urban typologies while working in five boroughs in the city of Santiago. Recoleta, Conchalí, San Ramón, Lo Espejo, and San Joaquín. To better understand the magnitude of the city urban system, Santiago has 32 boroughs, and only in five, in the five above mentioned, there are 231 soccer fields. That is nearly 100,000 square meters, and a square, usually with benches and a playground, accompanies most of them. The number of community centers and other neighborhood organizations is much bigger. Only in those five boroughs, there are 2,259 communal spaces. Due to the pandemic, the widespread loss of jobs and the ensuring economic uh, crisis that the pandemic brought with worse than a social crisis that had already exploded before the pandemic with the uprisings in October 2019, this means increasing numbers of vulnerable people that lack access to food and sometimes even shelter. This has led to an increase of different activities related to the kitchen domestic realm, especially within the organization of communities and cooperation between neighbors, bringing the daily routine of cooking into the public space, a well-known phenomenon in Chile and Latin America as the communal pot or olla común in Spanish. This experience is not new, but it really appeared and intensified significantly due to the pandemic. The communal pots have been historically related to the economic and political crisis that affected Chile since the beginning of the 20th century. In the 1980s, under the military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, the communal pots reappeared as a means of alleviating the inequality produced by the economic crisis that followed the implantation of the neoliberal economic system. Communal pots should not be romanticized. Still, they exist and allow us to understand social, economic, political, spatial, historical, and programmatic systems of organization. The soccer field, often associated with squares and community centers, are since last year housing the communal spots. These common spaces are full of information of interactions and uses. We are interested in the possibilities of programmatic organizations that are being triggered in this non-typology, an architectural system of elements, devices, and an infrastructure of uses. We identify some of the points in which these three typologies plus the Oya Común intersect in the city. And, it, and in order to study the situation, we chose a specific case, an archetype that due to archetype, sorry, that due to its conditions can be used as a means to understand a recurring phenomenon that belongs to a larger system, not only in Santiago, but also in Chile and Latin America. The chosen case is one of several that we identified in the catastrophe, which we'll use as a prototype to test a way to collect information, but to do so in, in an analytical way that can trigger design. The soccer field, uh, the community center, and the square. This case is located in Recoleta at the north area of Santiago, between the Blanco and the San Cristobal Hill, specifically in a neighborhood called Villa San Cristobal. This complex was built in 1971 under the government of President Salvador Allende. This system is not only related to actors close to the soccer field. This ecosystem is complex 
because it involves different actors that belong to the neighborhood, as well as some that are located in neighboring blocks. This archetypical case of the non-typology hosts a series of activities that are detonated from the physical and programmatic crossing of the urban typologies and other contextual actors at the Mustagi Foundation, the housing complex, nearby small businesses, and so on. Like a children, children's home that uses a soccer field, the soccer field every week, in addition to working in the community orchard, or the small or the small business of Mrs. Maria, which plays an important role it's because it serves as a collection center for the supplies for the Oya Común. Uh, Mineral Water Company and Mi Parque Foundation organized a campaign to remodel the square, a project that is, is in process. Also, the municipality of Regoleta regularly organized a series of social events in the soccer field. This series of activities mentioned before are associated with the different physical typological supports that integrate this system, which, have, which we have identified as the non-typology. These activities occur with different frequencies and schedules. Some are permanent and others are more sporadic. We were able to identify a series of devices and objects that together with the physical support allow some of these different things to happen at the same time. The communal pots are part of an even larger system that starts with the supply of ingredients, the preparation of the food, its distribution to the act of eating itself. The soccer field is one of the supports with more, where more things happen. It becomes a kind of multipurpose space where activities of many different kinds take place, like soccer games almost every day, Christmas fairs, municipal, municipal activities, artistic and cultural interventions. The square also hosts a wide variety of activities, such as being a playground for the children or more sporadic activities that take place when the square is not being used for playing, such as political and social assemblies. The community center is a place where solidarity activities are frequently held to help neighbors and serves as meetings for smaller organized collectives, such as mother groups, meetings with children and elderly reunions. In addition, this community center has a library of 700 books and a community orchard. The relationships between space, objects, activities, and their time frequencies allow us to understand how these different activities can happen in the same place, but not all at the same time. Our proposal so to understand the relation within this non-typological ecosystem documenting the speciality of them interactions, the devices that take place around them in the form of a catalog. This catalog, or rather systematic analysis, is not an attempt to solve the speciality of the Oyas Comunes, but rather a way to define guidelines to generate an operating manual for designing new spaces for the multiplicity of uses that arise from the community's interactions. Understanding a catalog not as an ordered list or a compilation of parts, but, but as a tool for analysis and especially one that allows to understand relationships. We decide to challenge the book format, which usually document it at each activity, element, or character separately, in attempt to emphasize the relations within a system that take place in a physical environment. In this sense, our catalog is closer to a map where all the parts of the system and how they relate to each other can be understood simultaneously. As we understand it, the study and analysis of this particular case already give us tools to understand and work in other places where this not typology exists. And finally, we want to show you a first attempt to think of a type of intervention that would allow this mix of permanent uses, understanding the soccer field fence as a social infrastructure. The fence as, a de as the device that could allow this constant interaction of activities associated with the non technology This new infrastructure turns the fence into a space that becomes a programmatic support for the social system of the neighborhood. We didn't invent or propose the activities that take place here. We learn from them. We are not the inventors of the 3D fence, but the interesting thing is that by understanding understanding what happened here, we can borrow and design some, some alternatives 
that will further support and enhance what is already here. We are sure that there are many more possibilities, of course, and we hope to develop further based in the map catalog. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could ask um, Shani, Ila, and Ina to uh, come back on, on screen. Thank you. I, I loved uh, hearing the different tools that you have um, have developed and how you each of you plan to advance them. Um, I think Sean is going to kick us off for this this uh, discussion, and uh, we will resume for the next presentation in about uh, ten minutes. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking, given how engaged or embedded all these projects are in community, I was wondering if everybody could share maybe a you know, particularly uh, difficult or challenging experience they had with community engagement, uh, or alternatively, uh, an unexpected success. Um, should I answer? Yeah. For us, I think that as I think that for you, it happened. Also, it was very difficult to visit the places at the beginning because we were here in Santiago at least last year for. I think that almost six months in quarantine without even go outside of the house. So for us at the beginning was very difficult to go to the to this specific archetype that we chose. Um, but I think that in our case we could like we contact the community through social media first, and then we had a lot of like Zoom meetings, and then uh, we were able a uh, few months or a few weeks ago to uh, go to the place and interact with the neighbors. But at the beginning, I think that that was the most difficult thing to really like visit uh, this case and walk around and talk with the neighbors. I think that that was the most difficult thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think maybe we our project have the same problem because we are trying to <laughs> go through the communities in Brooklyn and the Lower East Side, but not like last summer, there might, because in some vacant lots, there are not many population here. And because of the COVID, we cannot gather uh, so many people to have the uh, community activities, our community engagement to uh, give us more feedback and ideas. And uh, so I think it might be the most challenging to our project. I think also that um, like this part of community engagement, of course, it, it's challenging, but I do see like a lot of enthusiasm around it, like people want to kind of make a change or to, to benefit from like a change. Uh, so they have ideas to share. But at the same time, I think like, for example, in our project that we think, I think someone mentioned it in the chat, like about maintenance. Um, and like, if you create this kind of open space, how you make sure like the community take care of it, like, uh, you know, the other, um, beads or nonprofit or the developer. So this is also kind of a question how you give something to the community, but make sure that like it keep like for the, for the duration it's there that it still like benefit them. So maybe this is kind of a, something. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, prior to obviously the challenges of doing this all online, um, you know, in a lot of community engagement sessions, there seems to be, you know, some people will come in um, with kind of wanting to naysay a lot of things or, you know, kind of poke holes in, in some projects. Um, and, you know, one thing I found that was pretty helpful would be to actually try to kind of guide people through thinking through how they would problem solve for those same issues they're proposing and kind of, you know, almost yeah, problem solve in real time. So in, in, at bring on everybody as a problem solver rather than just kind of a you know, and gesture of the information they're receiving. Um, I think that we have a more like a comment uh, for Inat and you too. Um, because we were, uh, we were chatting while you were presenting um, guys, because there, there was a case here in, in Santiago um, where a lot of cases here in Santiago, like projects that 
were called Laza de Bolsillo, that it's, um, the translation is pocket square, um, that were built, they were like also temporary and very sporadic, like for, I don't know, a year or a little bit more probably, but um, it was very similar, I think one more with a, a low budget probably, but um and we we were thinking that maybe you can like look this project in santiago because it has a lot of um information and a lot of uh, ways to um, connect with the city that maybe could be useful for you i don't know i can i can write the name in the chat later for you but we were thinking about that yeah that maybe. that would be great like every kind of idea lead understanding how you implement this thing like would be great like there's so many aspects to this kind of actually come and you know especially when it's privately owned so it's it's also kind of challenging so everything yeah that uh, every reference will love to kind of hear and i think that in this case it was different because they were like public um lots but they were like more like abandoned so maybe they, they have like some things in, in common but maybe it's useful too so I will put the name in the in the chat. Sure, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Um, it's exciting to hear how the challenges and the opportunities can be similar in different communities um, in these different locations. So thank you so much for sharing, and I hope you guys have a chance to collaborate in the future maybe um i'd like to introduce the next group of presenters we're going to shift from um, the community scale to global scale and uh, examine global climate so the first presenter is sika who has brought on her um her climb hub partners if I could invite you guys to turn on your cameras. Thank you. Uh, okay, you're muted. Sorry. Um, so just for the sake of time, it's just going to be me presenting, but when we have Q&A, all of us will turn on our cameras. Is everyone able to see my screen? Perfect. Okay, great. My name is Sika Amousika Cedro. I am an alumnus, um, MUP 2013. And I will be walking you all through today through a prototype we built um, that is focused on coastal cities in Sub-Saharan Africa. But this specific prototype um, was built for Ghana. So um, the idea or the call to action that we were responding to when we built the Klim Hub app, which is supposed to be a portal where climate related data and case studies can be crowdsourced, downloaded and visualized um, was just a call to action from the World Bank blog um, to developers to develop um, a, a centralized repository um, to actually asset and risk map what it, the assets of coastal cities across West Africa. Um, and this is because of their economic importance and they tend to be the population centers in all of the West African countries. Um, and so the emphasis was really on coastal habitats that um, are important to the livelihood and the economics of the cities and Basically, um, according to the blog, it was saying that about 56% um, of the GDP um, that are generated in these countries come from, or in the West Africa subregion, come from coastal cities. So, um, in terms of Klim Hub, our goal is to actually um, hopefully 
create a platform that's used all throughout the sub-Saharan sub-region, but we are starting in West Africa and in, we focused on Ghana specifically because of three factors. Um, it's political economy, um, the fact that it's actually had stability for a while. And we felt that because it's an, a middle income country that's very close to the actual um, largest economy in sub-Saharan Africa, which is Nigeria, um, it's only about a 45 minute plane ride away from Accra to Lagos. So those are two, the two capital cities. Um, we really felt like this was a great place to start. So what you see in front of you are the maps, are a map of Southern Ghana with um, the, the yellow triangles indicating the coastal cities that we are trying to get a sense of what is happening there. So um, what we were trying to do is basically, as I mentioned before, look at the assets and also some of the risk um, that are the risk maps and understand what's available and what, um, what we could do to help centralize and improve the user experience for her. So the two research questions that kind of guided us as we started to actually do investigation, do the data mining and start to actually piece together data sets were these two. And it's really about understanding how decisions are being made and how what are the, the data and resources used to actually understand how risk and assets are distributed. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has a lot of um, the, the least accurate climate models. And it is one of, it is the continent that has the most vulnerability when it comes to climate change. And so with that, we, we felt that this is a very important um, set of data and these are very important questions to be asking in order to actually um, understand what mitigation could be done and help contribute to that, that um, field of research. So our initial goals after setting out those research questions were broken up into sub goals where we were trying to understand sort of what's the data that exists and then what's the culture around that data. Um, and from there, um, this is a shout out to our team who did a great job. Um, Bless who is, was doing a lot of the data mining on the ground in Ghana and then JP and um, Kwabano who are both in North America um, were instrumental in getting the prototype and the demo that we have together. So our hypotheses were that, you know, there would be something there. It might not necessarily be that great, but um, we would at least be able to get some climate related data um, and be able to actually centralize it. And we were trying to also investigate what are the institutional partnerships that exist. And um, from there, figure out how we can add value to what was already there in the ecosystem. So in front of you is a screenshot of our, our prototype. Um, and this is the actual initial screen that you get when you log in. Um, you are able to choose the subregion, um, And for the purposes of this presentation, we're focused once again on West Africa and the country of Ghana. Um, in order to basically make sure that we were providing information about the country, some very basic demographic data. We had an overview. Um, and then we created some different layers and filters in order for people to understand um, what where human settlements are, transition zones, ecosystem services, um, and then also create filters um, that um, look at the district maps, the political maps, the administrative maps, and then also the population and some of the infrastructure. This in front of you is an example of some of the infrastructure maps and visualizations that we have been able to build within the prototype. Um, and then this is um, a density map for human settlements. Um, so the value that we found after we built the actual prototype 
um, that we felt we, well, through investigation and through talking through various stakeholders is this um, information about climate data, um, what you see in front of you is just like rainfall averages. Um, what we found um, after building the platform, demoing it to a group of six folks within one of the coastal cities of focus, which is Winneba. Um, so we talked to a bunch of researchers and also students that are at the University of Education um, at, in Winneba, Ghana. And we were able, we were shocked by what we were told. So we, we, we asked some very simple questions about, okay, where do you get data? How are you able to get data? Um, and what, what, what data, what tools do you use that are online? And um, the last question was, what, what are the tools that you would need? And overwhelming, the overwhelming response was rainfall, precipitation, and temperature data. That's not a bit easily accessible. And we were kind of taken aback by that. Um, and so what you see in front of you is the tabular data that we were able to find. It's around, we were able to find 10 years, but these were um, sort of monthly averages. Um, what, what would actually enhance climate models is to actually have some of these data sets um, that are more on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis so that the actual climate models and also the research is a lot more, um, more focused and accurate. Um, and we are, so in terms of revisiting the initial sub goals that we actually found, when it came to the data sets, we found that often they had to be purchased um, through a municipal authority or through the Ghana unit, um, meteorological services. And that's not ideal because there's variability in what people pay and also how long it, it takes them to get the data. Um, in terms of micro data sets, we found that there wasn't really a culture of sharing or institutional coordination around data. Um, and our, our prototype was actually pretty well received, which we were surprised about. I, I thought people already had access to a lot of data, but we, we found out that that's not the case. And if they are able to access data, there's a lot of hurdles they have to actually, um, they actually have to jump over to, to get that data. So um, also, us trying to understand how case studies are being shared. It's primarily right now, um, especially in this part of the world through conferences, which have been kind of halted with COVID um, or brought online, but um, in terms of the, the frequency of data sharing, um, excuse me, of actual case study sharing, it is not as frequent as pre-COVID. Um, and we did find that there were centralized data sets from the World Bank, from NASA, from USAID, and then from um, the GIS Institute over in Ghana. Um, and they were all open source. And even um, Ghana has an open data platform. The, what we didn't find is a lot of climate data. Um, and so that is where we see the opportunity to kind of take this and really provide um, additional um, value to the researchers who are really focused on this part of the world. Um, and so in terms of where we're going from here, our key tasks moving forward, once again, is the historical rainfall and temperature data, focusing on identifying micro data sets and and embedded in that is trying to, um, through one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions with um, our our um, company, Uncut Lab, and um, these institutions, um, trying to actually foster uh, um, at least a culture of data sharing in our our um, our cities of focus. Um, we also know that we just kind of provided the very baseline data that is needed, um, but really trying to start start to create a tool that can actually do more comprehensive risk and asset um, mapping. And um, uh, connected to that is the spatial analysis and data visualization features. And then um, the creation of historic land use maps based on satellite imagery, we would be doing that um, through um, our own human resources. And we still have three 
very general questions that will be guiding our work moving forward, which are, you know, where are the data um, and, and basically um, at what scale should we be looking at and um, what should visualization look at like. So with that said, we want to say thank you to GSAP. Um, big, big thank you to Dr. Cujo at the University of Education at um, Winneba in Ghana and to my team, Bless and JP, who are on the line, who worked tirelessly, who didn't understand the space we were getting in <laughs> before we started, but continued to plug away at it and created a really beautiful tool that is much more accessible than what's available right now. Thank you so much, Sika. It's always exciting to hear updates on your on your project. Um, we are just doing a time check. We're at 8 p.m. And we have two more presentations, uh, Tree.3 with James and Eric, if you could turn on your cameras. Uh, they have also developed a web-based data visualization platform. And um, I'm excited to introduce you to, to what they've been up to. Hi, um, my name is James. Um, I'll be presenting uh, Tree3 along with um, my partner, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Um, let, let me quickly share my screen. And let me know if that worked, and then I'll go ahead and get started. Looks great. Yeah, it worked. Excellent, thanks. Um, so, like I said, I'm James, and I'm presenting uh, with Eric. Um, all right. The increasingly urban future is all but certain. Estimates suggest the amount of new construction required to accommodate the population in 2050 will effectively double the amount of all built space that existed in 2020. Around the world, timber harvesting and use in construction is riding, rising dramatically as a core part of this continued growth. Conventional and new engineered wood products are more popular than ever. They are heralded by leading architects and construction advocates as environmentally sustainable alternatives to steel and concrete due to their carbon sequestration properties. Yet the discourse on material sourcing and the larger climate and health implications of timber-based cities has been insufficient, particularly in relation to forest health. 3.3 seeks to investigate two questions related to the global timber trade. First, where does our wood come from? And second, what are the global impacts of local architectural interventions? It does this by merging valuable tools and data sets from related fields that have remained disparate for too long. These are tools for environmental advocates to study forest change, tools for planners and economists to study the trade of goods, and tools for builders and conscious designers to assess the life cycle and energy of their products. But what's missing right now is a cohesive, intuitive, and free tool that connects these threads together. 3.3 aims to solve that problem. It provides users with the ability to explore and learn about the broader global implications of local architectural interventions by putting all of this in one place. Before we dive into that, let's back up and just get some quick context. Wood is ubiquitous in architecture, so much so that it is the focus of American framing, the US pavilion at this year's Venice Biennale, designed by Paul Anderson and Paul Preisner. The project, among many other things, is an exploration of the analog and ambiguous quality of this so-called humble material and its domestic applications. But wood is anything but humble. Though outside the scope of the focus of Biennale, wood's ongoing popularity as a building material has had major consequences. Industrialized harvesting has devastated the world's forests, particularly in tropical regions throughout South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. While global deforestation rates have slowed in the past three decades and are primarily linked to cattle and agriculture, the increasing demand for engineered wood construction products means that architecture will be responsible for a larger volume and larger percentage of deforestation in the coming decades unless alternative practices are considered. Raw carbon metrics and on-site sustainability are ultimately meaningless if they result in devastation at the source. Roughly one third of the world's land is covered by forests. And while there has been modest growth over the recent decades in some of the blue areas you can see here, there has been overwhelming loss due to natural and artificial deforestation. About one sixth of the world's forests has vanished in the past 150 years, over half of that just since 1980. 
When we try to evaluate the efficacy of wood-based construction, what do we miss when we ignore the costs at the source? How can an individual understand their relationship to this larger picture? The global trade of wood is immense. In 2018 alone, roughly 6 billion cubic meters, or 200 billion cubic feet, of wood products were harvested and traded globally. This has huge economic implications for exporter and importer countries. This example from China, the world's largest importer of lumber, illustrates some of those implications. While its biggest partners by dollar value are mainly large stable economies such as Canada, the US, and Russia, its partners for whom lumber represents the majority of its trade with China are primarily global South nations with vulnerable ecosystems. This economic imbalance means that nations such as Gambia are beholden to their reliance on exporting wood commodities to the detriment of their local ecologies. For builders and designers, life cycle assessment tools provide a way to track and quantify these environmental impacts for their projects, including wood projects, products, all the way back to the source. Life cycle assessment tools enable high fidelity metrics for sustainability and global warming impact. But they only tell half the truth. Current LCA tools focus on the bottom line numbers at the local site of intervention. They can be robust and detailed, factoring in every gallon of diesel, every inch of steel, every mile traveled but they don't tell you a story. They don't provide qualitative and more fundamental concerns related to the sourcing of these materials. A wider picture of the global wood trade is missing. And additional costs such as deforestation, habitat loss, exploitative economic relationships, and others are not considered. We've tried to combine these various data sets from these tools and others, forestry models, global trade data, carbon and energy tracking, to create tree three. A, a timber trade tool by converting data charts, complex programs, and a static map into an interactive web tool. Uh, so like I just mentioned, Tree3 is an interactive portal for education, exploration, and advocacy. Uh, it shows who is producing and consuming specific types of wood products and how wood in all of its forms moves around the globe. Next slide, please. This is the map portion of the tool. Um, here users can um, explore different countries and engage with different UI elements on the map like pop-ups. Next, please. Uh, this is the input panel. This is how users control uh, the, the portal essentially. Uh, they're able to switch layers uh, and filter for types of flows like import and export, uh, and also to filter for different types of timber products. Um, and here, this, this kind of allows the user to begin to dissect what is otherwise a very dauntingly large data set uh, into manageable, manageable chunks. Next, please. This is the output panel. Um, here, uh, key information is displayed about what you're currently seeing on the map. Uh, it also highlights important statistics uh, and has some nice visualization so the user can uh, begin to stomach those numbers and statistics as well. Next, please. Uh, here you're seeing the forest uh, coverage layer of the tool, uh, as James has just shown. Uh, and you can explore around, uh, for instance, we can click uh, on the Ivory Coast. Next. And then this will pull up all of the, the details for that specific country, um, showing forest coverage as well as forest loss. Uh, so we can see here between um, the years 2000 and 2020 approximately 40% of forest coverage in the Ivory Coast uh, was lost. Uh, and we wanted to, to make sure to connect forest, cover forest coverage info uh, with uh, global trade, uh, just to begin to bridge the gap between these two uh, so that we could connect uh, the global wood trade and environmental conditions at the source of wood extraction. Next, please. Uh, this is the global production and flows layer of the tool. Here, users can filter for specific flows as well as products uh, and see which countries are important players for, for those products uh, and also click on uh, and explore around uh, and click to see which countries interest them for here. Uh, for instance, here we're looking at the flow of plywood into the United States. Uh, you can clearly see that the US is receiving plywood from many countries around the globe. Um, and also we, we show the top five uh, trading partners by volume. Uh, so here are the usual suspects, China, Canada, 
Russia kind of big timber producers uh, are the US's top trading partners in terms of receiving plywood. Um, next slide, please. Uh, likewise, we can easily switch the flow to export. Uh, so here we're seeing the export of plywood from the US to different countries around the world. Um, again, the US is a big player in the plywood exporting game, uh, exporting a lot to countries in Latin America, uh, with top countries being uh, Canada, Mexico. Interestingly enough, the Bahamas made the top five, um, which I was not expecting to see. Um, next, please. And then also with this tool, uh, something that we found very interesting is that if you look at more specialty wood products like tropical hardwoods, there's some really kind of interesting findings to be had. Um, here we're looking at the export of tropical round woods. Round wood is just um, logs, for lack of a better word, uh, from Ghana to countries around the world. Um, and with some very kind of minor exceptions, the lion's share of tropical roundwood from Ghana is going exclusively to um, India and China. And, and this portion of the tool um, we find really interesting because it allows you to uh, begin to spot trade imbalances between certain countries in the uh, global timber trade. Next, please. Um, there's a, another portion of the tool where you can investigate um, the interaction between trading partners. Here, uh, we have highlighted Ghana and China, and you can see all of the wood products exchanged between the two countries. Um, for instance, here, uh, the trade between these two countries is characterized by um, raw wood commodities flowing from Ghana to China, uh, most notably the tropical round wood, and then more um, fabricated materials like plywood and and veneer flowing in the reverse direction from China back to, to Ghana, albeit in a, in a much smaller volume. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, last, the, the kind of last piece of the tool is a case studies component. Um, and for this portion of the tool, we, we wanted to include it um, just so that the more kind of number centric, heady parts of the of the tool are grounded in real world, world projects. Um, and this portion of the tool allows for single narratives of specific wood products to be told um, from source of extraction to the site. Uh, and we have three different types of uh, case study sites, uh, project sites, so that's where buildings are happening, production sites, that's where wood is being um, manufactured from raw materials into the various products. And lastly, harvest sites. And these are generally kind of forests where wood extraction is occurring. Um, one such case study is Ritter Ranch, which we have highlighted here. Um, this is a 7,200 track home development outside of Los Angeles. Uh, if the user clicks on that case study, you will see um, this. And, and this is showing all of the key wood products that we've chosen to highlight for this case study. Um, here, that would include plywood, dimensional lumber, and OSB. And what this is doing is tracing those products from the project site through sites of production all the way back to uh, sources of extraction. Um, for instance, here you can see for plywood that was used at Ritter Ranch uh, coming from uh, a production site in a city in China and then being traced back to a forest in um, eastern Siberia. And then also included is some uh, volumetric statistics about those different uh, products. Next, please. Um, and then lastly, for each of the products, uh, we show the embodied carbon and emissions data for each of uh, the commodities um, at the different stages of extraction, production, uh, and transportation. Ultimately, Tree 3 is a platform for exploration and education. Uh, the timber trade tool can provide better access to the complex and overlapping data that represents the process and effects of timber products. The current fragmentation of individually robust but narrow data sets and tools available to environmentalists, economists, policymakers, planners, builders, designers, and developers has left each of those groups underserved to the detriment of all. We hope that Tree3 can be a useful tool to help connect the threads of each of their roles 
in a larger story of the global timber trade. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Eric and James. Uh, and now I am uh, excited to, to bring on Linda and her partner, Claudio, to talk about Extratopia. Okay, can you guys hear me and, and see the presentation? Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, so my name is Linda Tilling. And I'm Claudia Studillo. And we are both architects from Chile and we are Aure. Uh, Aure is a research and design practice based in Chile. And in October 2020, when we started thinking about Extractopia, a research idea to challenge the extraction economies uh, deployed throughout the Chilean landscape. The goal was to visualize the extractive machine of a copper mine in the Andes, in this case, Los Pelambres, with a very straightforward proposal. Let's visualize it and contest it. But as in any research, nothing is straightforward. This quote is by Freddie Perlman and his book Against History, Against Leviathan. And it goes, um, the beast knows itself to be a machine, and it knows that machines break down, decompose, and might even destroy themselves. A frantic search for perpetual motion, machines yield no assurances to counter the suspicions, and the beast has no choice but to project itself into realms of beings which are not machines. Those who are not machines, human, non-human, and entities belonging to more than human realms, their entanglements, and the ways we collectively move forward into a future scenario post-destruction is what we're researching. To understand copper ore entanglements, we asked, when does Los Pelambres start? It starts 5.3 million years before present time. We're in the Pliocene epoch of the geological scale, at elevations between 3,200 and 3,600 meters above sea level. Los Pelambres and Frontera, along with the copper molybdenum deposit at El Pachon in Argentina, constitute Los Pelambres El Pachon porphyry copper cluster. It's the 18th century. We are in our most common historical scale. The Spanish Empire starts mining along the Andes to bring the riches of the West Indies to Europe by using indigenous labor known as mitas. Theodore de Bray, a Belgian engraver, depicts the circumstances of a famous silver mine in Potosí, current Bolivia, referred to as the mouth of hell. Silver extraction with boiling mercury led to the forced laborers poisoning due to refusal by the Spanish Empire to dig ventilation shafts. Moving between the depths of the mine and the surface meant pneumonia and respiratory infections for the Indians. Potosí, once the economic center of the Spanish empire, helped fuel the globalization of the economy. Silver found its way to every corner of the world. 70 years after its opening, the ore was exhausted. It's 1914. William Braden Buford, known as the King of Copper, discovers the copper ore deposit we now call Los Pelambres. Braden, an engineer for the Omaha and Grant Smelting Company, was sent to Chile in 1894 with the objective of seeing the International Mining and Metallurgical Exhibition at Quinta Normal, Santiago, and to inquire about the possibilities of mining in the country. This exhibition is considered a cornerstone for industrial mining in Chile because it introduced foreign companies and their machines and technologies to a society eager for development. The exhibition was ready to be held in April, but got postponed until late October because machineries to be exhibited at a mock-up level were later decided to be exhibited full size. In a pavilion, Chile reassembled after its inauguration at the Paris World's Fair in 1889. Braden never got to mine his copper out of Los Pelambres, but was the successful mastermind behind El Teniente and Potrerillos, which he later sold to the Guggenheim brothers and the Anaconda Copper Company to cash himself out of financial problems. It's 1967. The Instituto de Investigaciones Geológicas prepared the first geological report for Los Pelambres, which formally identified the porphyry copper affiliation of the prospect, created in 1950s to support research and publication of scientific texts related to geology. In 1980, the Instituto de Investigaciones Geológicas merged with the mining service to form the Geology and Mine Services, currently known as Cernagiomini. Two years later, in 1969, 
Los Prelambres Exploration resumed under a joint program conducted by the United Nations and ENAMI, the state mining agency. But no further exploration took place until 1979, when Anaconda South America purchased the property from the local owners and undertook detailed exploration, culminating in 1983 with a completion of a feasibility study. But with the copper prices at the time, such a large scale project was considered uneconomic and all work was discontinued. In 1985, Antofagosta Minerals purchased Anaconda Chile and the rights to Los Pelambres. Securing in October 1997, the Environmental Resolution Number no. 71 from the National Environmental Commission, CONAMA. Extraction was about to begin. The company was officially inaugurated on April 5th, 2000. Okay, the mine. It took 86 years since its discovery to start an extraction process of 37 years. In 2037, uh, the mine will exhaust the mineral and in 15 year period of dismantling will take place. This is where and when Extractopia starts. The mine describes itself through four operation areas, each of them seemingly disconnected and confined, but further together by discrete infrastructures that carry the copper slurry out of the Andes into vessels on the Pacific Ocean via pipes 120 kilometers long that run across beaches, are buried alongside highways, run beneath sidewalks, and hoover about towns. The structure machine owns a circulatory system. The mine is not only a structure, but also matter out of place, which constitutes its environmental liabilities. Each of the mine's operation areas leave behind new landscape comprised of waste and co-opted nature-based solutions that are reshaping landscape. From the desalination plant facilities that during operation will alter the bay ecosystem at Puerto Chungo and is already doing so by introducing red cask eel as a mitigation measure. A eucalyptus plantation to rival the city of Los Vilos footprint. Originally designed as a 70 hectares evapotranspiration zone to deal with the water taken out of the copper slurry in Puerto Chungo. Now, a 141 hectare zone. Tailing ponds at El Mauro and Quillayes that will leave behind 2 million tons of tailing. These tailings will forever remain as a legacy of our own geological epoch. And slack heaps on top of the rock glaciers and high mountain wetlands and reshape that reshape our borders with Argentina. This type of extraction and the environmental liabilities left behind are no stranger to Chilean geography, mostly concentrated in the central region. A recent survey indica indicates that 389 of 757 national total tailings are found in the Coquimbo region. In the province of Chuapa, where Los Pelambres is located, 13 are active, 52 inactive, and 26 abandoned. El Mauro is the fifth largest in the country, and along with Quillayes, amount to 2 million tons of tailings, both of them closely monitored by an earthquake away from disaster, or at least a strong wind. Like the one this time last year, that a blue Toxic, a toxic dust of particulate heavy metal on the town of Caimanes. So after our trip, we decided to retrieve more information about the massive environmental liabilities that develop as the fleshy bodies of the structure machine. Knowledge about this new landscape can only be retrieved via their environmental impact assessment. 22 projects in the last 21 years with more, uh, with more that 20,000 pages of content developed by consultants hired by the mine are available online at the Environmental Impact Assessment website. And what struck us the most was the way this ecosystem impacts were drawn and the seemingly interchangeable nature of non-human species like trees, fish, and waters. Remove one and compensate somewhere else. The open pit the slack heaps, the tailing ponds, all take advantage of the high ground, low ground topography. All sit on top of areas that saw water run. Water that is not caught before it reached low ground and is bypassed 
to the nearest town. It also revealed the ways this content is explained to community members in the mandatory community participation meetings, avoiding complexity via presentations, no conversations. And how ecosystem concerns are presented by participants to, to these meetings, but hardly ever addressed. The pages on this slide read, I can hear the frogs at night anymore, or my whole life I cook shrimp. I've sent my kids to school and support my family because of it. Now there are no shrimps in the river. This is the moment we realized we needed to build a network of advisors to understand what our own discipline to is enable to grasp. That is how we approached a marine biologist, a forest engineer, a microbiologist, and a glaciologist, asking them what concerns they express around these messy environmental liabilities. To our surprise, much of the current literature does not address co-opted nature-based solution at this scale. So for whom do we draw? As we started to develop the idea of speculations, um, we saw a much urgent need around the ways we visualize what the mind is and what it does. What, how do we draw what is there but can be seen because of scale? How can the biocultural heritage of a place be put front and center confronting the idea of managerial development? This past May 2021, the mine submitted for review the environmental impact assessment for a new and final stage of its development, which introduces a desalination plant to Los Vilos Bay. And following Chilean environmental law, we are currently waiting for the official community consultation to participate with drawings that would translate the concerns the subject matter experts expressed. So in partnering with the NGO Surgencia, who do outreach and environmental education in Coquimbo. We've been discussing the impacts of brine in the introduction and the introduction of a conger eel in Los Vilos Bay, understanding what, the, what do the documents inside the AIA not show. These discussions are for the development of a portfolio of drawings to be printed out to bring to the official community consultation and start a conversation rather than a presentation with the mine consultants that run these meetings. With the prompt, what do we know? With the information obtained from the official reports and a follow-up set of drawings with the questions the subject matter experts express related to the mine submitted baselines. And we're doing the same with the eucalyptus plantation and a forest engineer. Charging the drawings with what we know from previous EIAs and current academic knowledge production. This is an ongoing exercise since going through all the information submitted takes time. This strategy follows um, Javiera Barandiaran's work where she suggests revolutionizing AIAs. The proposed strategies differ but entail the need to put the uneven ecological and legal outcomes of previous environmental assessments at the forefront of the baselining processes in the present. These drawings are part of an action that recognizes the EIA EIA documents as a landscape ledger that mostly registers the mine's input. Knowledge about our territory, its capture inside the reports of private companies that hire consultants to enable extraction, leaving the state with no capacity to contest them. To bring these representations to the meetings is a strategy to secure that the community's concerns are not only voiced but also seen and that the drawings get archived within the official community consultation document, which usually just displays content as text. This time, a visualization will tag along and remain forever embedded in this ledger. In 2013, Arque Ediciones, an architecture publishing house in Chile, in conjunction with GSAP, published Who Cares for Chilean Cities? We ask, who cares for Chilean landscapes? The development of our Extractopia research related studios and exhibitions, and our other research threads that, are st that started with the incubator prize financing can be followed via our social media channel and website. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Linda and Claudio. That was, that was so um, amazing. And I know that um, Linda, who teaches in Chile has a number of other initiatives that are embedded uh, and, and interlaced with this 
research that is supported by the incubator. So um, I love that it has uh, continued life in, in other forms. If I could ask James, Eric, Sika, JP, and Bless to come back. Um, I, we have time for one question um, from James for the group, and then we're going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, James? Yeah, um, thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, um, one thing I find really interesting in both the projects um, is sort of this pursuit of connecting various methodologies and ideas like extraction, harvesting, tracking, modeling, visualizing um, in pursuit of sort of propelling communities. And um, you both explore methods that kind of relate to this on the ground expertise uh, and connect them sort of in tandem with wider uh, data analytics and data visualizations. Um, so, I, so that was something I found really interesting. I wanted to ask both of you sort of how you understand how to choose between those methods or how you choose to combine them. How do you sort of balance the kind of multi-scalar uh, approach in terms of developing your projects? Okay, I think Sika, I don't know. If you you don't can go for <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, in our case, um, the multiscalar um, approach of collecting data, it, it's been a challenge. This is actually why we switched from, we're gonna just go ahead and do a speculation and then we realize there's so, many, so much data that goes unacknowledged because it's not visualized properly. It's Needless to say, we mentioned in the presentation, it's 20,000 pages of information. Right now, there's several initiatives um, in Chile to um, understand how uh, the environment data gets visualized. There is um, an initiative in, in a university in Santiago called Observatorio Ambiental, who actually asks those questions. How do we actually empower communities uh, through the publicly available um, reports that private entities put out, but are somehow the only knowledge we have about our environment. So um, the multiscalar situation, it's a challenge, uh, but at the same time, I think, and we both feel right now that it's a, it's a very, it's, it's, we're at our crossroads here in Chile. Um, last weekend, we elected uh, people to write our new constitution and the rights of nature are being put forward and center. So there's a lot of a scientist that got elected to rewrite the new constitution. So environmental concerns and the ways that we engage with the data sets, I think are gonna be uh, discussed more widely and, and we hope to also participate in that conversation here. I don't know if that actually answers the question, but. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's really interesting. Um, it, uh, sorry, I don't wanna uh, cut you off, Sika. Um, yeah, for us, I think we because we still haven't necessarily explored um, all the stakeholder groups, um, each of the real estate developers are interested in parcel level data and solar banks while um, and they're their stakeholder group while um, you know um, climatologists are kind of um, interested in the macro level stuff so for us we're we're letting sort of how things evolved and guide how we approach the scale question. Um, and I, for me, I had these grand ideas that we would be able to cover West Africa within like one or two years. And I'm realizing that if we're talking about scale and the interplay of scale and these climate models and data, um, that we might be spending a lot more time developing our relationships, our partnerships, than I originally anticipated um, because the data isn't there. So we're talking about digitization of information. We're talking about making it, um, negotiating contracts to make the, the actual um, data publicly available. So that is all what we're now as a team trying to sort out as we move the, the hopefully the project to a new phase. Yeah, it's super interesting. Oh, go ahead. It's just I was thinking also that like, you guys both um, touch on the, the the problems of like securing data sets. For us here, it's not that the data set it's not there. It's like who built the data set, and that's the thing that we're kind of like challenging. We've been mm -hmm. talking a lot about uh, um, at some point of our research through one of the research threads, 
to actually enact some sort of um, citizen science collection of data because there's so much information uh, that lives within the communities, but it's not part of the uh, the, the information that gets um, um, placed inside the baseline um, that the mind develops. It's usually consultants, private consultants, colder, uh, that build it the, the baselines, but um, in the process of doing so, uh, neglect to incorporate community data also for their changing landscape. So there's an interesting concept there because uh, the baseline somehow fixates a moment in time. And there is a, a counter argument that we should be looking at baselining processes of like, how do we collectively construct the data set? I don't know if you guys have given any thought to that regarding your own project, because I was very interested. We were talking where do you guys find the, the data sets for the, for the timber trade. Well, you bring up a very good philosophical question, which is the way we, we think about data is it's this objective thing, but it's not because it's very much influenced by who creates it. And it's not something that I had even thought about um, until you actually brought it up. So um, for us, we are thinking about how do we even use what's available and use AI and other um, techniques to actually fill in the gaps because of the simple fact that maybe some in some countries, this information is not gonna be there, but we never even thought about what is the actual sort of legitimacy of what was the baseline that we're actually feeding the machine. Um, and so I think you bring up a really interesting, a really interesting area of inquiry that we need to kind of dig, dig deeper into as we move forward our project. Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean, these, you know, similar sentiments for our project. I mean, one of the challenges we had because our, our fundamental goal is to try and combine pretty disparate data sets. Um, we spent a lot of time sort of investigating what it would mean to overlap them. Do they even overlap? If they do, how, what does the produced data set? And there, there's certainly a bit of authorship there, but we're also, um, because of the nature of our data sets and sort of the, the, the scale of them, we're a little bit uh, kind of beholden to what we can find. Um, certainly with you know, large timber trade data sets um, coming from you know, huge institutions, World Bank, UN, et cetera, you know, there's sort of baked in a level of uncertainty with that. Um, but there's also, you know, it's, it's very difficult to kind of evaluate uh, that level of uncertainty. So we knew going in that we had to really be a little bit, we had multiple data sets that were sort of showing uh, related ideas and we knew that we could overlap them. And if certain things didn't line up or certain things really stood out that didn't make sense, we could investigate that a bit further and say, okay, maybe some of these numbers are wrong or, or you know, something needs to be investigated a little bit further. Why, uh, you know, are certain countries seemingly, um, you know, producing more than what makes sense. Um, and that's something that we spent a lot of time. Eric was really um, like a kind of data uh, Wiz was really able to like investigate a lot of that stuff super uh, e efficiently. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously a challenge to try and, you know, balance that ultimately because, you know, we want to make the tool, but we have to, we have to work with the data that we can get. I think one of the other issues that we've been dealing with our, with, with our project and a lot of other projects that kind of operate from 30,000 feet, you know, looking down on the earth is how do we kind of tell the story of the data that we want to tell without getting lost in space, for lack of a better word, and how do we ground it? And, you know, what do we lose by only staying kind of at the level of that data? I mean, of course, we're kind of missing out um, on all of the kind of community knowledge and knowledge on the ground that you had mentioned. Um, and I think one of the ways that we kind of willingly tried to, to mitigate that was by incorporating the case studies in, in our project and in that way kind of grounding it a little bit. Um, of course, that's not you know su a super exhaustive way to do it, but it's something that I think, at least when I do these types of very data heavy, big data set, oriented projects, something that I'm aware of that I don't want to leave the audience kind of lost in space and disconnected from what the actual project is about. Um, so that's another kind of balancing act that you have to play in my mind. 
I have one more question. I'm sorry, I, Linda, sure. this is for you because you are doing a lot of what we are trying to do. Um, you know, uh, our our aspiration is to make our platforms a, a, a crowdsourced um, data set. So, um, Pika? micro data sets. And so, Sika, I'm sorry. You know what? I, I, I actually would love to let you guys um, continue this discussion. So let me wrap up the formal program at a, just to let everyone else go and we can let you guys stay on. Does that? Does sure. that um, because I, I love hearing this discourse and this is the, the part of uh, the goal of the incubator prize is to advance this this kind of um, interchange of ideas and fostering this collaboration. So I love this. Um, but I also want to thank everybody else who presented tonight. I want to thank David Benjamin for his leadership and Lila for helping us, um, as always, getting every program out the door. Um, so thank you and please stay in touch. If anyone um, watching the program has a question about the Incubator Prize and the next cycle, please feel free to email uh, me at gsapalumni at columbia.edu. The applications are open in August for the next cycle and uh, the class of those graduating 2007 to uh, 2021 are eligible. So look forward to those applications. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>